Motivation of wholesome desire. At this point, let us return to the term chanda, which we have defined as desire for wholesome qualities, kusala dhamma chanda, love of virtue, kusala chanda, or love of truth, dhamma chanda. Kusala dhamma chanda is translated as desire for wholesome qualities and enthusiasm for and to delight in virtue. Kusala Chanda is translated as love of virtue, although the term Dhamma is removed. Kusala Chanda has an identical meaning to Kusala Dhamma Chanda. Kusala may be translated as wholesome, skillful, favorable, proficient, healthy or salubrious. It refers to things that are beneficial to a person's life, things that promote wellness and prosperity for an individual and for society. Dhammachanda is translated as love of truth or a desire for truth. The term Dhamma often has a general meaning referring to thing or teaching, but in this context its meaning is more far-reaching. Here, Dhamma has two principal meanings. First, the truth or teachings that reveal the truth. And second, virtue, goodness, virtuous quality. And to, extent, and to some extent, ethics. <coughs> Dhamma Chanda can thus be rendered as love of truth, love of virtue, desire for truth or desire for virtue. The desire for truth points also towards knowledge. A person wants to know the truth, to realize the truth, to realize the true meaning, true essence and true value of things. And the desire for virtue is linked to action. A person wishes to generate goodness. Dhammachanda can therefore be translated as intent on truth, love of truth, intent on goodness or love of goodness. It includes an aspiration for knowledge, a desire to act, an eagerness to act. A simple definition for Dhammachanda is intent on truth. With the understanding that all the aforementioned explanations are included in this definition. In a similar fashion, the term Chanda on its own can also be translated as intent on truth. Chanda, de Chanda desires truth and virtue, it desires knowledge of truth, it desires to act in order to give rise to goodness and produce truly beneficial results. Chanda is thus related to action, specifically action performed in order to know the truth and to create goodness. Why is it that when wholesome desire, Kusaladamma Chanda, is mentioned in the texts, it is usually linked to the desire to act, kattu kamyata. The desire for knowledge and goodness solicits action. In order to arrive at knowledge, truth and fulfillment, one must act. To use a play on words to access the real one. <coughs> to use a play on words to access the real one must have zeal. For this reason, the desire to act is an attribute of wholesome desire or of the love of truth. One can even say that the term chanda is a synonym for katu kamyata. The desire to act is wholesome desire. Sooner or later, when the text mentioned wholesome desire, kusala chanda, or the love of truth, dhamma chanda, they normally conclude by stating that Chanda is equivalent to the desire to act, Katu Kamyata Chanda. <coughs> In reference to the mode of conditionality, Patsya Kara, the Buddha said that Chanda leads to perseverance, as U Saha, or he mentioned Chanda as preceding effort, Vayama, or energy, Vidya. Put simply, Chanda generates action just as tanha generates seeking. Related to this subject, the commentaries say that the cause of wholesome desire chanda is wise reflection, yoni so manasikara. This passage indicates that wholesome desire is part of a conditional process involving wisdom. 
Wholesome desire commences when a person begins to apply wisdom, just as the arising of craving depends on ignorance. Comparative analysis. To sum up, one craving tanha is focused on feeling vedana and des desires objects in order to experience feeling, or desires objects for personal gratification. Craving is generated and sustained by ignorance. It is linked to personal issues. It centers around a sense of self. It leads to seeking. <coughs> To wholesome desire, chanda is focused on well-being, on what is truly beneficial, and on the quality of life. It desires truth, goodness, and virtue. It desires fulfillment and wholeness. Chanda is generated from wise reflection. It is objective. It is not bound up with a sense of self, and it leads to energy, effort, and action. There are two points here requiring special emphasis. A. When analysing whether a person's actions, including thoughts and speech, are dictated by craving or not, one can use the following criteria. Desires or actions that are tied up with a search for gratifying sensations that protect or promote the stability of a fixed sense of self, including on a deeper level the undermining of the self, are matters that fall under the category of craving. The passages leave it the passages craving B The passages craving leads to seeking and Chanda leads to action are very helpful in distinguishing between these two qualities. The, this distinction has a crucial bearing on ethics and on Dhamma practice, which will be discussed below. Craving desires things in order to experience feeling and the gratification of craving is achieved through the acquisition of these things. Any method used by craving to acquire gratifying objects is referred to the term seeking, pariyesana. The methods for acquiring these things vary. Some methods acquire action while other methods, for example, someone else provides the object does not require action. In the case that action is required, however, the object desired by craving does not have a direct causal relationship to the action. For example, Mr. Gully is a janitor and gets a monthly sal salary of $300. If you finish reading this book, Daddy will take you out to the movies. Many people will think that janitorial work is the cause for receiving the salary. Cleaning is the cause and the salary is the result. Such a conclusion, however, is false. It stems from an habitual and self-deceptive way of reasoning. For the statement to be accurate, one must insert missing clauses. The action of cleaning results in a clean building. A clean building is the true result of cleaning. Receiving a salary for cleaning is merely the result of an agreement made by a certain individual. There is no certain causal relationship between these two events. Some people who clean buildings receive no money, and most people receive salary without having to clean buildings. The second example is similar. Many people will think that reading the book is the cause and going to the movies is the result. But in fact, the true result of reading a book is the gaining of knowledge. To finish reading the book is merely a condition for going to the movies. In the first example, Mr. Gully's behaviour is compelled by craving then he cleans only because cleaning is a requirement for getting money. He does not desire a clean building, and he does not want to sweep and clean. <coughs> In the second example, the child wishes to go to the movies, and she reads the book only because it is a condition for getting the object desired by craving to see a movie. She does not desire the knowledge contained in that book, and she has no wish to read the book. Strictly speaking, craving does not lead to action, nor does it generate a desire to act. 
In these cases, action is merely one possible method following a pre-arranged agreement used for attaining sought-after objects according to the needs of craving. These two examples also clarify the quality of chanda which desires virtue, truth and knowledge of the truth. With chanda, Mr. Gilly would desire a clean building and the child would desire the knowledge from the book. Both individuals desire the direct results of these actions. The results appeal to the causes. The results help determine the course of action. Action is equivalent to generating desired results. Cause and effect are intimately linked. When Mr. Gilly sweeps, clean. When Mr. Gilly sweeps, cleanness arises, and it arises every time he sweeps. When the child reads, knowledge arises, and when it continues to arise, the more she reads. <coughs> Chanda, des Chanda desires the virtue resulting from action, and thus also desires the action itself, which is the cause for that virtue. In this sense, Chanda leads to action, and leads to a desired desire to act. This helps to explain why the second kind of chanda, kutu kamyata chanda, the desire to act, is equated to kusala chanda or dhamma chanda, the desire for virtue or truth. If behaviour is guided by chanda, Mr. Gilly will have an enthusiasm for sweeping the building that is distinct from receiving a salary, and the child will read the book without her father's enticement to see a movie. There are many other ethical implications to these two forms of desire, but at this point simply remember the distinction that craving is the desire to consume or experience, while chanda is the desire for truth and action. <coughs> Problems arising from a set of preconditions. The ethical or practical consequences of using either craving or chanda as a motivation for action vary greatly. When a person uses craving as the motivation, action is merely a prerequisite for obtaining desirable objects in order to satisfy the sense of self. The person does not directly desire the action or the results of the action. His or her direct aim is to obtain the desired objects. In many instances, the required action is merely one method of obtaining the desired objects. Therefore, if one is able to find a method of obtaining these things without having to act, one will use this method and avoid doing anything. Because obtaining the desired objects without having to work is most compatible with craving, and if it is po impossible to avoid action, then one will act reluctantly, unwillingly, and without real enthusiasm. The consequences of craving are as follows. When one tries to avoid having to perform the prearranged action, one may seek a shortcut or an easy alternative to acquire the desired object without having to work. This avoidance may even lead people to behave immorally. For example, if Mr. Gully wants money, he has no enthusiasm for or dedication to his work and feels he cannot wait. He may seek money by stealing. If the girl cannot put up with reading the book, she may steal money from her mother and go to see the movie alone rather than wait for her father to take her. When one craves to acquire and has no desire to act, one will perform required actions simply to get them over with, act in a hasty fashion, or act to convince others that one has accomplished the deed. The result is a lack of precision and excellence in one's work, and one will develop bad habits like disinterest in achievement, negligence and half-heartedness. For example, Mr. Gully may joyously sweep day in and day out, waiting for his salary, and the girl may read the book in a distracted way without gaining any knowledge, or deceive her father by reading only the first, middle and final page, and claim she has finished it. 
When the original agreements have been breached, there arises under achievement carelessness, avoidance and deception. As a consequence, strict secondary preconditions need to be established for support and protection. But this is only attending to sim symptoms making the entire system more complicated and confusing. For example, it may be necessary to find a supervisor and inspector for Mr. Gillis' work and verify the hours he has spent working. It may be necessary to have an elder sibling check on the girl or else the father may need to cross-examine her book, cross-examine her on the book's contents. When craving dictates behaviour in response to these secondary terms and conditions, new layers of faulty and immoral conduct arise until the entire system becomes disrupted or useless. When the desired object differs from the direct result of action, then the value of the action cannot be measured by its result because the action is being performed to serve some other goal. Such as a case, there is an imbalance between the action and desired result. The behaviour of people who aim for desired objects expected under the terms of an agreement is likely to be either excessive or deficient, and is likely to be inadequate for realising the beneficial, virtuous result stemming directly from that action. People then determine the value of the action by the acquisition of desirable objects. The basic rule for action performed as a prerequisite for acquiring desired ob sense objects or the distinctive rule of craving is the more I obtain desirable objects, the more I act or the more I experience delightful feelings, the more I act. Action based on this premise is never ending and possesses a flip side of If I don't acquire desirable objects, I won't act or if I don't experience delightful feelings, I'll remain idle. Apart from being defective uh, and a missed opportunity, action that is performed for results differing from its direct beneficial results also creates negative effects. A simple example is that of eating. When a person eats purely with craving, then if the food is delicious, he will eat till he is bloated. If the food does not appeal to his desires, then he will eat too little, leading to discomfort and sickness. The action is eating, which results in adequate nourishment for the body and is a prerequisite for experiencing delicious tastes. The negative effects of craving are widespread, as will be discussed in further examples below. In the case that action and the things desired by craving are not directly aligned by cause and effect, craving is averse to action and resists work. Craving attempts to avoid work by trying to obtain things through no effort at all, and when it is essential to act, then people act begrudgingly. People, act, people acting with craving, following prescribed terms and conditions, tend to find no joy or satisfaction, either in the action itself or in the fruits of their labour. The things desired by craving abide virtually in isolation, disconnected from the deed. As long as one does not acquire the desired objects, the craving for these things remains and acting to fulfil certain preconditions may further incite craving leading to disturbance and anxiety. The state of mind of someone who acts with craving is restless, confused, stressful and nervous and is, uh, and is often accompanied by other unwholesome qualities like fear, distrust and envy. A lack of fulfilment and dissatisfaction can lead to severe personal problems like stress and mental illness. When these problems extend outwards, they create difficulty for one's life in general and cause affliction for others.